Hello, yes, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV, live from the Wild Wind Workshop. Um, I know I said I wasn't going to do the live stream anymore, but I thought I can't just cope with having a Friday without connecting with the global Joyrider TV community. So hello, and I'm glad that you got the last minute memo that this was going on. So what we're going to do here is this is a live uh, question and answer session where I'll be answering your, your questions as well as some preloaded questions that people have already asked by email or in the comments of other videos. Um, if you are watching this later on, um, so it's currently 5.30 in Greece on Friday, the 2nd of July, if you are watching this at a later time, then I won't be able to respond to you live in the video, but I will respond to you in the comments. All right, I'm just going to see if I can turn on the live chat. Hello, Stuart, and hello, Garibals. Nice to have you with us. Um, hello, Vits of Blitz. Wow. I'm, um, nice to have you on board. I don't believe we've met before, but uh, nice to have you. Hi, Rob. Uh, great to have you down here with us in the workshop. And today, um, the technology that I'm using, hopefully this will work, is usually I do this off just 100% off the telephone. But today I'm using the 4G off the telephone and then using the, uh, the Macintosh computer uh, using that as a Wi-Fi hotspot thing. So let's uh, have a pop. All right, Dawson, hi. Chug Slayer 69, great to have you on board. Long time no see. It's been, certainly has. All right, Askar Yusuf. Uh, have a go at my name. Yeah. I think Askar Yusufi. That sounds, uh, sounds pretty close to me. Hello, Richard. The horrifying gamer really wants to come to Greece and sail with you. Yes. And so you should, because the action uh, has been very, very high quality in, um, in Vasiliki Bay. Not just this week, but the whole of June. It has been absolutely cooking. Oh, thanks, Asuka. I'm glad that I was close. Ah, and Panos is on board. Panos is actually coming here tomorrow so uh we're gonna be um panels is actually gonna be picking up a um a top cat i think it's a k1 or k2 top cat uh which is very exciting so we're going to be taking a look at that perhaps we can even make a video on the top cat to show what it is um so that you can see uh martin it sounds like martin's just going out for a sale great choice yeah Good on you, Panos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I would strongly recommend if you are even slightly entertaining the thought of coming to visit us here in uh, in Vasiliki, Greece, then the answer is yes, you should, because the sailing has been fantastic. It's not um, not particularly busy, loads of space on the water. Um, you don't have to book a table at a restaurant in the village. That's for sure. Hey, Scoop, how you doing? Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm just going to take a look at our first preloaded question. So hopefully this will work. Okay. Um, so I've got a preloaded question from Jeff, age 11. Um, I don't think Jeff is actually age 11. And he is wanting to practice writing his FX1, uh, which has got wings on it. And he said he tried... And um, he's 82 kilos. He had, I think he had his son helping. And um, he really had a hard time getting the boat back upright. Now, one of the things he's putting this down to is the fact that he's got wings on the boat. There are, of course, different types of wings that you could have on the catamarans. So hold on, let's draw a really... Good picture 
This is not, of course, the FX1 hole shape. It's pretty good though, I think. Not a bad picture. So this is looking at the boat from behind. There, Not all um, wings are the same. So the classic wings, which I like to call lovingly the picnic benches, are these ones which would come like on a Hobie Getaway, Hobie 17, Hobie 18 Magnum, and um, quite a few other boats, Hobie 21 Sport Cruiser, Hobie 21 SE, um, the kind of racing boat. Um, you don't see them so much on modern boats these days, apart from uh, on sort of custom builds, like if people are doing some long distance sailing. Um, now, there are, of course, pros and cons to this style of wings. Um, so, the firstly, the pros, the positive things of having this sort of wings on your boat is that you don't have to trapeze. You can quite happily sit on the wings and you get the same amount of leverage as if you were on the trapeze. So, um, if you perhaps don't want to trapeze. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you don't like wearing a trapeze harness. Maybe you've got some sort of condition that means maybe your knees aren't too good or your back or something. So um, these wings are absolutely perfect if you come into one of those sort of categories of not wanting to be a trapeze artist. Um, if you do trapeze off these wings, you get an absolute ton of leverage so you can really keep the power pulled on um, and it's really exciting to be so far away from the boat you get an amazing view of the boat from out there very nice indeed also the wings what are they good for they make the boat so much bigger so your trampoline or deck space let's call it would usually be here but with the wings, you're almost doubling the amount of deck space that you have on the boat. So it is making a lot more boat of your boat. I've got some sort of cat fight going on in here, would you believe? Um, also, if it's light winds, you can sit. I'm going to draw this on. You can kind of sit here using the wing as a very comfortable backrest. Very nice indeed. That's Ricky Nielsen, um, as, as you've seen him on Joyrider TV in the past. Um, one of the, the key members in the Wild Wind Boatyard, that's for sure. Um, yes, and the final positive that I would say about the wings immediately is if you're doing some long distance sailing, the wings uh, are a really good facility for storing equipment if you don't want it to get wet so those are your positive points on the wings now let's go on to the negative points um the first one is they they are going to add a fairly significant amount of weight to the boat i would as a guess i would say they'll probably add about 50 kilograms to the boat maybe not quite that much um, if somebody fancies Googling it and putting it in the, the live chat, then we will know. But I'd say about 40 kilos, definitely, they will add to the weight of the boat. What they will also do is add some windage as well. So you've got all this. When you're going upwind, the wind's blowing onto the boat and it's going to be blowing onto the wings. So the actual speed increase of the extra leverage is going to be kind of offset by the extra windage that you have by having those wings. And then if the boat, to answer the original question, all right, let's see if we can do this. Let's just do a very simple one. Mast, boat, we're capsized. There's the mast, there's the boat. There's the wing. The other wing would be under the water. Let's draw on the hulls. Okay, so what 
this is going to make it harder to write the cap size because we've got the weight here, which is, let's say, when you're capsized and you're writing the boat, the kind of pivot point of where you're writing the boat from is this hull. This wing is the wrong side of that pivot point, so that is trying to pull the boat down. So it will make it more difficult to write the capsized boat. And also, you're going to get a bit of drag in the water from that one as well. Pardon. Um, so there you go. Those are what I'd call the pros and cons of the standard picnic bench style wings. The other style of wings, which are quite reasonably common, are kind of like what Hobie would call sport wings, which would just be a much smaller affair that just sticks out the side. And that gives you a bit more leverage for trapezing, um, which if you want that extra leverage or if the boat is designed with those sport wings, like the um, Hobie 20 formulas that we used to have in Europe, um, they were designed to have the sport wings and the sport wings really do add quite a lot of sizzle to your ride and not as much weight added with those. They were pretty light, actually. OK, so there we go. There are some there's a bit of chat about wings on the catamaran. Hope you um, are happy to see that explanation. There's been quite a lot of chat coming in. Who have we got? We got Pedro. I believe Pedro's down in Chile. Great to have you on board there, Pedro. All right, Stuart, would you recommend <laughs> squinting like a mole? Um, would you recommend if somebody is doing a gap year to come and work in green or a similar place to you? Um, yes, absolutely. If you are, if you've got a gap year and you are a very enthusiastic sailor, then to come and do a season somewhere like this is one of the best things you can do. You get so much out of it. Not only the great sailing, but you meet so many people and that gives you a lot more. Um, it just really sets you up for life. If you've met a lot of people, your social skills definitely go through the roof, as do what I've seen over the years from working here um, on the beach is people's confidence, self-confidence just goes up and up and up. And it is brilliant to see uh, public speaking skills, problem solving, uh, being able to work unsupervised, uh, being responsible for things, um, those kind of things, being able to um, communicate with people from out of their normal social group. Um, like on in the sort of sailing holiday places, you do get a lot of um sort of professional people coming out who in the normal in your normal life you might never meet people like that but um out here you meet them all the time and um it's really nice to see how the sailing instructors working on the beach develop um in many different arenas of course you become really really good at sailing by doing a season like this if you apply yourself it's very easy just to come out, work on the beach. Um, and um, it is like the sailing is amazing, but there's also the other side, the nightlife, where every night is like a party, every meal is a banquet, and um, it can be very tempting to stay up late, let's say. So I'd say yes and yes. All right, Bullfrush, nice to have you on board. Hello. All right, Chug Slayer 69, how can I improve my upwind technique? Very general question there, Mr. Slayer. Um, but all right, so the most important thing when you're out sailing is where are you going? Um, upwind, we're going to determine where we're going. Don't know if green was the best colour. Oh, it's pretty good. 
we're going to determine where we're going by looking at the telltales on the jib. So if it's a, uh, a lighter wind, we don't want to have the jib absolutely cranked in as tight as it will go. We want to have it just eased slightly. So firstly, sheet and jib. So um, if this is looking at the jib from above, if we have it eased slightly, we get a bit more shape in the sail. If we have it, the sheet absolutely cranked in, the sail will be flat, which is great for heavy winds, but not so good if it's light winds. So just ease the sail, to just look at the shape in like the bottom part of the jib and put that shape into the jib there. And then once you've got the jib in the position where you want it, so light winds, heavy winds, and of course, a bit of a range in between, then we're going to sail the boat by looking at the telltales on the jib. So we've got the telltale on the side closer to us, and then we've got the telltale that we can see through the sail on the other side. So I think we're just going to answer this question in uh, terms of your course, um, because where are we going is the most important thing. So if it's light winds, what we're looking for with the telltales, so let's say um, light, and then down here we'll have strong. And then we're going to draw some telltales. This is very exciting. So in light winds, we're looking for both telltales flying straight back. That means we've got, when the telltales are flying straight back, that means we've got a good airflow over both sides of the sail, getting the maximum power out of the sail. And we've got a really good smooth flow of air over the sail. And that's what is being indicated by both telltales flying straight back. We control what the telltales are doing with our steering. So if the outside telltale isn't flying straight back, like if it's flying really high up or maybe even doing circles or something or dropping down, that would be because you're not close enough to the wind. So you need to turn a little bit closer. When you're altering your course, always steer very gently. And especially in light winds, just steer a little bit up towards the wind. Look for a change in your telltales. And if the outside one still hasn't appeared, then turn up towards the wind a little bit more. Um, so that's the outside telltale. If it's not flying, you need to steer more towards the wind, then the telltale on the windward side, the one you can see more clearly, if that one's not flying straight back, that would actually mean that you're perhaps too close to the wind and you just need to come away from the wind slightly. The inside telltale is basically an early warning of the jib actually flapping. So, um, very useful okay so that would be in light winds then if we just go light medium strong as the wind picks up and we've got good solid pressure the boat's going forwards nicely what we then want is the outside telltale the same and the inside telltale we want it lifting to about 45 degrees with the inside telltale lifting, what that's telling us is that we're still pointing close to the wind. If we kept them like this as we started going faster, our apparent wind would actually make us just sail more and more away from the wind as we go faster. So you have to let the inside telltale lift. And then when the wind's strong, so when we're double trapezing, 
Uh, downhill's pulled on maximum. We're going fast and we're really um, try having to depower a bit. Then one of the ways that we're going to depower the boat on the upwind is by sailing very close to the wind. And what this is actually going to mean is that the inside telltale is going to be almost vertical and the front part of the jib might actually have the wind in the wrong side. So it's going to be just flapping very slightly at the front of the jib. Okay, so I think that, if that's all right, that's going to be where I'm going to leave it for this upwind technique improvements. The course is the most important thing. So let's focus on that first and then we'll move on. All right, checking back in with everyone. Hello, Bill, in New Jersey. Great to have you on board. All right, Scoop saying, I was wondering what is the name and where can I find the connection piece that connects the bowsprit and the front beam? All right, um, yeah, I don't know what that would be called, actually. Um, I tell you what, Scoop, if you put out in an email, I'll look it up for you. Um, yeah, or if you go to the Hobie Cat website and look at a boat which has got a spinnaker, like even the 16, there's some pages on the spinnaker kit there. It should be in there. So what you're looking for, you could Google Hobie Cat parts manual and it will be in there. Mike, hi, how you doing? Is it possible to sail in Vasiliki Wild Wind in October, but can't travel earlier? Yeah, we'll be open in the first week of October, but it's unlikely that we'll be open any later than the first week in October. Um, you need, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it there, Mike. Yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing you at that time. Richard, trying to order a new Hobie 16 in Central Florida, is there a problem in their production or availability? Now, I can't comment on that. Um, perhaps if Rich um, is here from the um, class association, he might be able to comment. But that's not something that I know about. I would have thought that Hobie Cat in the USA would be able to supply new boats. Um, but you'll just have to get in touch with Hobie Cat USA or um your local dealer and find out what is going on there but um sorry i don't actually know all right bill oh where's bill gone bill just disappeared bill um i just purchased a three sixteenths diameter rope from salt dog and for the halyard rope my hobie 16 he said it's the recommended size is that true um if that's for the main halyard, hold on, let's just ask the Macintosh what three sixteenths is for in centimetres. That's not very helpful. 0 0.18. What does that mean? What does that on the, um, Yeah, so what I would use, um, I work uh, metric in rope sizes exclusively. So I have absolutely no idea what that means. But um, in the metric size, for your main halyard, I would use um, either a four mil rope with a Dyneema core or a five mil rope, which could just be any old um, polyester core rope. In fact, I'd go with the five mil. It would be much more um, easy on the hands when you're hoisting your sail. So... For the main halyard, five millimetres. For the jib halyard, if it's five millimetres, it absolutely has to have the Dyneema core because otherwise it's going to stretch because um, the jib halyard is holding the mast up. When you sheet the mainsail in, if it's not a really, um, if it hasn't got a good stretch resistance, then when you sheet in, the mast's just going to come back it's going to feel like your mask being held up by a bit of elastic. So 
Jib Halyard needs to be five mil with a Dyneema core. Or what we use here, um, if we haven't got any of that available, is we use a six millimeter rope with a polyester core. Hold on. I know you want to see it. Let's see what we've got. Here we go. So um, you'll have seen this rope um, around on the various boats I've been using. We use this on the trapezes as well. This is just a very basic six mil uh, rope with polyester core, not tremendously expensive, nice color. Um, and that is what we are using there. Sebu, greetings from Germany. Ah, oh, yes. Nice, that'd be Thomas. Eight weeks and I'm back again. Great. All right. Look forward to seeing you. Foggy Forest Farm. Thanks for all the great help getting started with my first boat. I've been looking for info on launching and loading on and off the trailer at the boat ramp, but there's not much. Can you do a video on this? Yeah, I don't. And I wouldn't actively, unless it's really the only way that you can get your boat into the water. I wouldn't actively recommend using the road trailer to launch your boat because if you repeatedly putting the road trailer into the water, pulling it out, your um, the bearings and all of the the whole thing is going to deteriorate a lot quicker with salt water eating it away. You really are much better off to get a like beach dolly launching trolley um something like that for the actual launching of the boat um i have got a road trailer but for the same reason i'm not particularly keen to put it into the water um so because uh it's not going to be very good for the trailer and we're definitely using um uh, launching trolleys here. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, there was a, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. S yeah, sorry, I can't help you there. Jasmine, greeting from Hong Kong. Great to have you on board. Knack Daddy is here. It's all right. We can all feel a lot safer now in Greensboro, North Carolina, USA. Greg, love watching your videos. Very helpful. Finally got to see you live. Yeah, nice to have you on board there, Greg. Have you ever sailed a Taipan 4.9 or 5.7? No, I never, I've never been on a Taipan, to be honest. I um, would be very interested to have a go. All right. The horrifying gamer. Is there an affordable and user-friendly camera mount you could recommend? Please explain setup if possible all right yes there is and um all right if everybody can hang on i'm just gonna get one all right chat amongst yourselves all right i'll be back in a sec okay i've come back and i've I've got some interesting pieces in my hands and um, all right. So this is, this is the best camera mount. Um, if you've got a boat, which has got a chain plate at the front like this, where the bridle wires attach and the jib attaches on here somewhere, then this mount, uh, which is one that I've kind of made, I bought, I bought these parts off eBay Um not particularly expensive, um, but you could actually use another one of these. This is what um, I'd call a chain plate, but Hobie Cat call it a stay adjuster. Um, and basically I've bolted the regular GoPro uh, connectors onto here. So you can put the camera there. And then I've just put two bolts through here, one with a handy convenient wing nut Let's see how convenient that is. All right, we're, we're really into the demo here. Um, okay, 
just taking that off there. I think we can see where this is going. I have made a video on this and other mounting options. And then this one, I would then slide either inside or outside here, probably outside. So then when we put the bolt back on, it kind of, for some reason, I, oh, I've been putting it on there. That's what I've been doing. All right. So I put it on there, bolt back on, and then that is a very secure uh, camera mount for getting those bridle wire shots. Very nice indeed, and it is stuck. But um, yeah, that's what I'm into. All right, and uh, the horrifying gamer is talking about a setup for YouTubing. Yeah, the other mount that I use the most frequently is just uh, the head strap mount, which is so convenient. Just grab it, put it on your head. That's really good if you're going to be talking as well, because then the camera picks up uh, the sound really nicely from you talking. The other thing you could do uh, is you could actually make a mount out of like a baseball cap or something where you actually um, just bolt a huge, uh, sorry, a um, GoPro slider fitting onto the peak of the cap. And as long as the cap's fairly rigid, you could just slide the camera on there. Very nice. Yeah, that's right, Thomas. That is Ollie, who's a member of staff, but he retracted his comment. Oh, my goodness. Chris. How you doing? Uh, upwind, my boat bounces a lot. Any tips for that in Fusion Mark II? Yeah, that would be one of the more modern F-18 hull shapes with a kind of inverted hull shape and a flat bottom. And to be honest, those style of boats do require a bit of persuasion to stop the bouncing upwind. So... Let's just uh, draw the whole, sh an exaggeration of the whole shape. So the bottom of the hull is like flat. And then it's kind of like that, like a walnut. Um, flat, and then the bow would come down like that. And then looking at it from the side would be, looking like that now the way to stop it slapping on the upwind is to try to get the point of the bow just in the water at all times then um what that means is it won't slap it will just be carving through but that can be quite tricky in choppy conditions to actually get it to do that so um the obvious way to get that point of the bow into the water is to move forwards a bit but the other way to do it is just to not try to point quite as high. And if you come down a few degrees, especially in trapezing conditions, um, def in fact, only in trapezing conditions, then what that's going to do, it's going to load up the leeward hull more and it's going to help to drive the bow of the boat into the water a bit more, which should give you a smoother ride. There we go. That's all I've got on that topic. Okay, the Horrifying Gamer has a Prindle 16. Yes, we want to see some Prindle 16 videos. And in fact, get some video footage, send it in for Show Us Your Cat. I've just actually pretty much finished editing this week's Show Us Your Cat. So the triumphant return will be on time on Sunday. Oh, yes, it will. At this stage in the game, if you don't mind, if everybody could just take their finger and hit the like button, that would be very generous. And um, it means more people will get to see this. I saw whoever that was. Thank you very much. And someone else. Yeah, brilliant. It's like interactive. All right. Ollie Smith of the Wild Wind staff. Um would you consider us a foot strap on a Hobie 16? Um, yes. And at the same time, no. 
Okay, the I would def it's we did do it once on a 16 here. We put some foot straps at the back. It is so comfortable just to put your back foot in the foot strap, front foot on the corner of the pylon or on the rubber grip on the sidebar. Good wide stance. You're really locked in and you feel tremendously secure. The problem is the reason it doesn't work so well is firstly because it can catch on the tiller arm. Let's see, we've got some materials here, the demo. Um, oh, here we go. All right, I'm coming back in a second. All right, foot strap, tiller arm. All right. Okay, this is the joy of being in the workshop. All right, we've got the tiller arm, and then we've got the foot strap. And if you've got the foot strap right at the back of the boat, what can happen is the tiller arm just kind of hits it when you steer, and that doesn't work very well. So that's that's one reason why I'm not a massive fan of it. The other, re other reasons would be that the low volume nature of the 16, the same goes for the Hobie 14 or the FX1, means that on the leeward hull, when you're flying a hull, perhaps there's a bit of some waves or something, then there is a chance you're actually going to be dragging your leeward hull's foot strap through the water, which is going to cause you excess drag and slow you down a bit. Um, the other reason not massively keen especially for the 16 is because you've got nothing to no way of bolting it in it would have to be fitted with self-tapping screws which um once those bad boys have ripped out there's going to be some big um uh big uh holes in the boat so all in all not keen but if you do happen to come across 16 with foot straps, that is very nice and comfortable. So, uh, yes and no, Ollie. All right. The horrifying gamer upwind tight rig, upwind light rins, tight rig. Yes. And yes. So, um, when you're sailing in light winds, you want to have your rig tighter and then in stronger winds on a boat like a Prindle 16 or Hobie 16, you want to have a looser rig when the wind gets stronger. It just makes the boat feel much nicer, brings your centre of effort a little bit further back, which makes the boat feel more balanced. Um, it also puts um, more weight over the back of the boat, which gets you more drive off the rudder blades. But in light winds, if you put the rig too far back, it is just not going to work so well with the general balance of the boat. All right, scroll. Well, I'm not really scrolling back so much there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Rich is on board from the class association. If uh, if Rich knows anything, uh, if he has, maybe he's already commented, I don't know. Um, yeah, Rich, if you know anything about why, I can't remember who it was, um, just scrolling back to find out who it was who was looking for one. Oh, Richard in Florida has, is keen to buy a brand new Hobie 16, but um, it appears that there's some sort of supply problem. If you've got any information on that, that would be fantastic. Okay, Greg uh, says, is sail trim with just a mainsail no jib, similar to trim with a jib. Yeah, very similar. Um, what we want to do, again, is it's the telltales. We've got the outside one, the inside, sorry, wrong way around, outside one, inside one. Most important thing is that the telltale on the outside of the sail, the one you can see through the sail, is always flying. If at any point that bad boy is not flying, what it means is your sail is too tight or like how we were talking with the jib or you or if you're trying to go upwind, 
you're not sailing close enough to the wind. So if that bad boy is lifting and you're sailing upwind, just bring your boat up towards the wind. Um, and um, But if going high, so high that that does start flying, really feels like the boat is going too slowly, then just ease the main sailor out a little bit as well, which is more likely to going to be in very light winds. Okay, so um, I think at that stage in the game, I'm just going to take a short commercial break. And welcome back. Okay, so Didums 55. Where do you say the best position for downhaul should be in both strong and light winds for both up and downwind courses for a dart? 18, if different for other cats. No, it's pretty much the same for everything. Um, so upwind sailing first. Um, light winds, you want to... You want to have enough downhaul on to take the creases out of the sail, and that is enough. If you then pull in the main sheet, and by pulling in the main sheet, you're putting more creases in the sail, you want to pull in a bit more downhaul to take those creases out, but that's enough. What happens with the downhaul on any boat is when you pull it on initially, the sail will go from... Um, a shapeless thing and then when you pull on the initial bit of downhaul then the sail will get shape and a nice curve and that's what you're looking for initially with the downhaul so then what you'd want to do is have a minimum downhaul setting on your mast so you know where to all right there's the mast how do we draw the sail bottom of the sail like that um so when you've established where the minimum is that you put the downhaul on then you could just get the easiest way is just to get a piece of tape or a marker pen if you've got a silver mast put a line on the mast there and you know that is the minimum setting then as the wind gets stronger um as you pull on more downhaul what that does is it starts to flatten the sail. It's moving the center of effort of the sail down and forwards, which transfers um, all that power into drive. If you don't pull more downhaul on when it's windy, the sail's just going to make you fly a hole more, but not actually going to help you to go any faster. So as it gets windier, more downhaul, um, especially on the upwind course. On the downwind... So um, so when you get to very strong winds, upwind, you want to really have your downhaul cranked on as hard as you possibly can. Then on the downwind course, in light winds, no difference there at all. And then the only time on a Dart 18 or a boat like that, I would personally alter the downhaul in strong winds, downwind, is if I was racing and I'm really looking to get as much power out of the rig as possible then easing the downhaul is going to put more shape into the sail similar picture to that what we drew about the jib earlier so when we initially put the downhaul on we're going to get this sort of shape as we put on more downhaul we're going to get this sort of shape which is much more efficient for upwind um, in heavy winds. And then if we want to get more power for the downwind, we can ease it and then we'll go back to more of this shape, which is going to really pull us along a lot more. All right. So Bill, Billy Beat from Colorado does 316th rope work for a halyard line. Okay, and Bullfrush says 3 sixteenths is 4.76 millimetres. So that's yes, it is the correct line that you have been sold there. All right. So 
All right, Chug Slayer 69, what is the recommended rope size for the main sheet on a Hobie 16? I would, I think the sweet spot is nine millimeters, which is actually quite difficult to come by. But I dare say, if you're using imperial measurements, it's probably going to be quite easy to get hold of. Um, yeah, so nine mil is the sweet spot. If you're just sailing in light winds, eight mil will be enough. 10 is always going to be too thick and won't go through the blocks very nicely. And for the Cunningham, all right, for the Cunningham, again, five millimetres is a nice gauge of rope there, um, especially if you can stretch to some uh, five millimetre rope with a Dyneema core. That is very nice. All right, and we've got Russell on board. Hi, Russell. Wondering if you have one of your helmets lying around like to see how your gopro mount is fixed to so the helmet i have actually yes all right here we go this is the helmet that i'm using uh it's a mystic helmet good quality brand coming from holland i believe and i've just used one of these curved gopro mounts on here with the the free M sticky pad thing that comes with these as standard. These sticky pads that come with the GoPro, these slider kind of mounts as standard, are so sticky that is going to be on there forever and a day. And then what I've done is I've just put a bit of elastic through the holes in the helmet for my security tie it on kind of thing there we go good question there russell um yes all right james can you do a bit more on the foiling laser yeah i'd love to um you could see just there those are the foil the foiling laser foils so there we go um yeah i'm i will try to i'll try to do some with a bit more commentary of what's going on because when I did the foiling laser stuff before, I didn't really talk about it. It was just sort of like, woohoo, this is fun. Uh, so a bit more would be nice. Hi, Pierre, and hi to everyone in Quebec, Canada. All right, Goebbels, how's the weather there in Vasiliki? Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, it's been hot and windy, which for many of us is the dream. And I have to say, in Vasiliki right now, we're living the dream. Mm. All right, Jeff M. Nakra, hi. Nice to have you on board. Thanks for tuning in. All right, Rob says there are two different trains of thought on the position of the jib tack on the chain plate. Some say as low as possible. Others prefer much higher to get more wind over the mainsail. What are my thoughts on that? OK, my thoughts on that are to get it as low as possible, but so you can still achieve a good shape. Um, what I'm feeling now on this as a topic, and I've been getting more boat speed since I've been doing this all of the time, is um, I'll just check it. Yeah, we do. Um, is I put, I'm now on the 16. I'm putting the jib tack in hole number two where before I was always going in hole number four. I know it doesn't sound like a big difference, but it does seem to uh, make a bit of a difference there. So I think lower down is better because what it's doing is it's, it's putting the helping to bring the centre of effort of the rig, the fullest part where the power is coming from, lower down, which means the power in the rig isn't so much going to encourage flying a hull. If you think of something that's top heavy, it's more likely to go over sideways, whereas something that's bottom heavy, here we go, Joyrider bottle, that way up, less likely to go over sideways, top heavy, more likely to go over sideways. We're doing that with by moving the jib down instead of, making us want to fly a hole more, it's going to be um, that power 
is going to be transferred more into boat speed, I think, in my opinion. Like on the F-18s and on the Tornadoes, we put the jib as low down as we possibly can for the same reason. So I think it's a good idea. There we go. All right, Jeff, could you advise on batten tension for the mainsail? I can adjust the tension with an Allen key. Could you explain how does it work? Ah, the French Breton in Hong Kong. Okay, so, um, yeah, with most boats, what I would advise with batten tension is you're just putting the battens in and tensioning them enough so that they can't actually move inside the pocket so that we're definitely getting rid of any creases out of the batten pocket. That is what we're looking for with the batten tension. I would say there are occasions where more batten tension is necessary. Like if you're going out in moderate winds and you really want to get as much out of the sail as possible, then just to squeeze a bit more tension in. But what is important is you've got your batten tension even. So it's not like the bottom batten's got a load of tension, the next one none at all, next one loads, because your sail's going to be a mess. So just make sure your bat batten tension is uniform throughout the sail. Um, but just a little bit of tension to make sure there are no creases in the batten pockets and the batten can't move. That is generally seen as the sweet spot. But in the boats which aren't quite as sophisticated or modern, which don't have pre-bend in them, like the 16 or the Dart 18, more batten tension is generally applied at times when you want to get more power out of the rig. All right. Evan, are you you oh you gonna try out more monoles like aero and maybe even some skiffs? I reckon you'd love a blast in a 49er. They're insane. Are you sorry? Um, I'm not sorry for not doing any monohole sailing or not much monohole sailing on Joyrider TV. Um, I do enjoy monohole sailing, but my field of expertise is definitely in the catamaran rather than in the monohole. You know, I could sail a monohole um, very nicely. Thank you very much. But um, yeah, I'm trying to stay focused on the videos. I know everybody would love to see a series called something like cat sailor on a monohull how does he get on um so there is a possibility but not massively likely just due to time constraints at this time we've got johnny on board hi johnny great to see you are you gonna be doing the 16 europeans no unfortunately not um my one event that I can go to this year is I only, only really have time to go to one event during the summer season, which seems to be when they all are, unless I leave the continent, which is a bit of a stretch. Um, the only one I'm going to be able to attend is the Tornado Worlds, which are going to be actually in Greece, which is tremendously convenient uh, in September. I hear you. You're going to be going to the Europeans there, Johnny. And uh, I think you're going to absolutely smash it. So have a great one there. All right. So we've got a reply from Rich from the Class Association in the USA. This is about the availability of 16s. He says, I have heard that boat sales have been very brisk. So it is possible that your local dealer may be temporarily out of stock. They will get more in. Try calling around. There you go. This is the great thing with the Joyrider TV Q&A. Everybody's here so we can find the answers. Thanks very much for that, Rich. Greg, thanks for the tips, Joe. Got to sleep now. It's almost 1 a.m. here in Australia. OK, thanks very much. And um, I appreciate you staying with us until bedtime. Hutchie, hi, how you doing? Evan, the more bat and tension you have also the deeper your sail is going to be. So you're going to need Cunningham as soon as you start moving, I suppose. Yes. 
it's true. If you've got a, if you've got a lot of um, bat intention, you definitely need to downhaul that bad boy a bit more. Nice. All right. Okay, Russell's saying something slightly derogatory about monoholes. I'm not going to read that out. Oh, right. Okay. Evan says, I didn't mean any offence by saying, are you sorry? <laughs> okay, nice. Uh, Daniel, greetings from Poland. Nice. Great to have you on board. And Evan says, my club has banned cats from racing. Uh, we don't get many cats in inland lakes, I suppose. Yeah, I think a lot of clubs um, over the years have banned catamarans because of the first reason is usually because of the amount of space they take up in the boat park. You could get four times as many lasers in a sailing club as you could catamarans. And, um, and also out on the water, if it is a small body of water, the catamarans can just be too quick for that place so they have to do what they have to do it's a shame but it is um just the one of the um things that comes from sailing boats which are so fast right i'm going to go back to some uh, pre-loaded questions all right oh it's it's jeff m nacra who we've actually got here with us he says, how do you prepare the boat for the heat of the summer season? Yeah, to be honest, there's not a huge amount that we do um, to get the boats so that they're going to cope with the heat more. One of the key things with the boats in the heat, we are, um, <coughs> although every, um, what I've heard is in Florida, it's much hotter than it is here. But it's pretty hot here, to be honest. And one of the main things that you have to do with the boat in hot conditions is take the bungs out while the boat is on the beach so that air can pass in and out of the hull. Because if you don't, what happens is some sort of air pressure um, anomaly that goes on in the hulls that can actually deform the hulls if you've got an airtight boat and can be quite bad for your boat if you really cook it with the bungs in if you have got a boat which doesn't have bungs i'd say it's well worth taking the hatches off the boat again so the air can pass into the hulls and that will also mean that your hulls are going to be totally dry as well by getting baked um one other thing that i would consider is definitely using a cover on the trampoline just so you're not getting excessive amounts of UV on the trampoline itself or on the ropes or any of the other fittings on the boat. The sun is really bad for everything and it will degrade if you don't cover it. So there we go. All right, Pedro, I sent you yesterday some pictures of a 1959 catamaran maybe some video of how old is your cat yeah love it i did have a quick look at that i've just been so busy at work that i haven't had time um, you may have noticed anybody who sends me emails and stuff in the winter you'll get a reply the same day but at the moment there's a little bit of a lag on replies to emails just because um i'm just so short of time at the moment all right, so going on to the next pre-loaded question. This is from Scott, who says, I've moved my shrouds down to the third from the bottom holes on the chain plates. Nice choice. If you're using stock rigging, of course. Um, I'm now experiencing frequently sailing on the bows, not quite burying them for a pitch pole. And my leeward rudder is up out of the water enough to throw a big rooster tail. <clears throat> I'm think, uh, thinking about going back up a hole or two on the chain plate. Um, and he says, he says, do I need to alter the rake of the rudders to compensate for the extra rake in the mast? Now, with the Hobie 16 or any any of the Hobies, in fact, 
they're all set so that they'll sail the best if the rudder is tucked into the stock as tight as possible. Um, so really tuck the rudder into the stock as tight as possible. I've never actually had the situation where I need to rake the less. I've got facility here. Um, oh, this is not looking like a good picture already. No, let's start again. Okay, so I always try to have the rudders. If this is the back of the boat here. I always try to have the rudders pulled this way as much as possible. And I've never had it in all of my days where it's actually been beneficial to have it go the other way. If we bring the rudder further back, what that's likely to do is make the steering heavier, which is more likely to give you that rooster tail experience, which you're feeling. <coughs> so perhaps your rudders aren't tucked under the boat enough. So maybe you need to look at that, but they definitely need to be pulled forwards as much as possible there, Scott. Okay. Back to the live chat. Yeah, gonna, if everybody could cease fire on any further questions, we've been going for an hour now and it's time to start thinking about wrapping this up. Thank you very much. Hi, team on. Great to have you on board as it is with Fernando. Hello. Hutchie says, drill a pilot hole in the hatch cover to allow the hole to breathe. Popular technique. I think what you can also do actually if you've drilled a hole, a small hole in your hatch cover and you're concerned about water going inside is you could just then put a thin piece of rope uh, through the hole that you've drilled and that will still allow the air to go in and out. But um, it will be less likely that water can go in there. All right. Daniel. What do you think about Prindle 16? For beginners in 2021, it's old catamaran, but is it a good choice? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a great choice. In fact, um, I have to be honest, I've never sailed a Prindle 16, but I would really like to. If I if somebody brought one down here on a trailer and just put it in the boat park, I'd be out on that bad boy tomorrow uh, like a shot uh, to see what it's like. But um, I would guess it would be sort of similar with the Hobie 16 in that it's not going to be the easiest boat to sail. It's going to present some challenges. But what that will do is mean that the techniques that you're learning are going to be very strong techniques because you're learning with quite a difficult boat to sail. But I would say, yes, it's a good choice of a boat to learn on. So you should go for it if that is available to you. All right, Jeff M. Nacra, thanks, Joe. You remembered that question from April or June. Oh, yes, we covered the full boat. We opened the hull accessories, Hong Kong, full sun, heat and humidity, six months of the year. Ouch. Mm. Okay, yeah, all right. I, do, I don't know, what, I couldn't remember where that uh, question had come from, but it was in my Q&A notes. So we got round to it available all right Ugwaski. hello you must be i'm guessing polish um unfortunately i can't use uh, the translator on the live stream so um what do you think about 140 uh 14 windsurfing yeah windsurfing's a good sport all right no more questions um all right, Jeff, what's the team weight limit for uh, Hobie 16? Would you say 160? If you're talking upper limit for like strong wind sailing, uh, I've sailed the 16 with uh, 220 kilos. That's a lot, but it just went really fast when it was windy. So that was all right. But I wouldn't go for more, much more than 200 kilos. Um particularly regularly, it's going to put a hell of a lot of strain on the boat. 
but she can take it. Uh, so yeah, just keep piling it on there. All right, Rich says, put a sponge in your hull to catch water that gets into the little hole you drill. Helps get water out of boats when you don't have bungs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so in the hulls of my tornado, definitely got the sponges in there. Incidentally, there was some absolutely powerful tornado sailing going on in Vasiliki Bay today. Probably 25 to 28 knots of wind. Uh, Bad Boy 94, absolute hammer across the bay. Ooh, video coming tomorrow. Uh, you're going to like it. Okay. All right, Ugwaski, Wildwind Workshop. Nice, I can hear you. I am outside. Oh, nice. Very good. All I can see outside is a cat at the moment, but um, I don't think that's you. All right, Wicked. Hutchy, great beginners, twin wire cat, twice the volume of the Hobie 16. It's talking about the Prindle 16. Oh, so a lot more volume in the, in the Prindle. Very nice. All right. Got one more preloaded question, then I am got two more. All right. Martin says, oh, talking about the tornado, uh, is it necessary to loosen the diamond wires and the rig tension? on the tornado after sailing it's to be honest it's never been something that i've done but i can imagine it will prolong the life of if, you're, if you've got the carbon mast then surely it's going to make your boat last a bit longer by not having it under tension all of the time so let's say rig tension yes ease it off after sailing and Possibly the diamond wire tension as well, although the diamond wire tension isn't quite as straightforward on the tornado to adjust. But if it is straightforward and you really want to do everything you can to prolong the life of your mast and your boat, because the constant pull of the shrouds upwards from those plates is possible to, you know, it's all extra stress on the boat. So I'm going to say, yes, it is something that's worthwhile doing. But no, it's not something that I do. Um, it's just I like Bad Boy 94 to be ready for action at any time. There we go. And the final preloaded question is from Thurman, who says, oh, this is a, quite an interesting question. And this is going to be the last one. So he says, why do people not use carabiners more on sailing boats uh, and instead people are using shackles or snap shackles? Just going to get one. OK, so uh, this is what we're talking about when we talk about a carabiner. This is, of course, a very large one. This is what we use on our moorings here, but it's all that I've got to hand at the moment. The reason why we're not using carabiners like to attach the main sheet, we do use these to attach the jib sheets on our Hobie Tigers here, and it works really well, but they're under less load than the main sheet. The only other place where you'd want to use one could be on the main sheet, the main sheet really is the, one of the highest load points on the catamaran. And just the design of the carabiner, it's not as strong as a shackle. So the actual carabiner itself would have to be much thicker to cope with the same amount of strain that a normal D-shaped shackle would take if that makes any sense at all. Makes sense to me. But thanks very much for your question, Thurman. But that is my understanding of why we don't use carabiners so much on the sailing boats. Um, yeah, I have had some carabiners kind of pull apart before just too much load. So there we go. I think that brings us up to date. Hello, Mike. 
Super work, Joe. Keep it up. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Um, we'll do. Hello, Toot in Texas. Howdy. All right. So I think it is almost certainly time for a beer, um, unless you are somewhere to the east where it's maybe like mid morning or something where it probably wouldn't be appropriate. But uh, thanks very much for tuning in. I'd like to thank everybody who's been supporting Joyrider TV. It's really nice to have your support, uh, whether it's through Patreon. Thanks very much for sticking with it on Patreon. And thanks very much for everybody who's been shopping at totaljoyrider.com. If you haven't been over there for a while, there are some new styles um, in the store. So head over there. Just try to choose the right size before placing your order. Okay. Jeff says, have a good weekend. Thanks for the live chat. Let's go sailing and drinking beers. Woohoo! All right. So I'll see you next. This seems to have worked quite nicely. So I'm going to keep the live chat going. Why no Dart 18? Um, it's a fair question, but uh, they just wouldn't cope with our conditions, I think. And perhaps they wouldn't last as long. The Hobie 16 is possibly the strongest boat in the world ever. But I've got to go now. Thanks, Mike. Mike loves the Dart 18s. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, see you soon.